Okay, today we are going to talk about um, enthalpy and calorimetry. Okay, those are going to be the big things that we're going to focus on for today. Now, with enthalpy, um, enthalpy is defined as the available heat energy of a system. Um, you'll see us use the abbreviation as a capital H for enthalpy, and we'll come back to that here in just a little bit. Now, also, if we're going to define en um, enthalpy, we're going to define it as capital H. Oops. Okay. So our capital H is going to be energy plus the um, pressure of a system as well as the volume of a system. And part of the reason we have to define it this way is because of when we talk about gases, we have to talk about if we're keeping the pressure of a system constant or the volume of a system, system constant. So we'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, also, when we talk about enthalpy, we typically have it be the process that's at constant pressure is the only, and the only type of work allowed is PV work or um, looking at the pressure and the volume of things. Now this is a little bit of ex accepting the proof, but if we know that energy is equal to um, the heat plus the work, and we kind of rearrange some equations, what we ultimately end up with is that we can say or state, however you want to say it, that the um, at constant pressure, the heat or energy of a system is equal to this delta H or this enthalpy unit. So that's part of what we're going to explain. Now for the enthalpy, the heat of reaction and the change in enthalpy are used interchangeably for a reaction at constant pressure. And we pretty much need to make this assumption in order to do a lot of the calculations that we're going to do for the remainder of this chapter. So the heat of the reaction, or Q, is going to be equal to the change of enthalpy, or H. And the delta H is going to be the enthalpy of the products minus the reactants. And again, this comes back to whenever we do calculations, it's usually the final minus the initial. Okay, so that's what we're going to have to take into consideration here. And along those same lines, if you have a positive delta H, that system is going to be considered endothermic. If you have a negative delta H, that system is going to be considered exothermic. Okay, now with enthalpy changes, um, all chemical reactions either release or absorb heat, even if we cannot observe it directly. Okay, so they're all going to release observe heat, or absorb heat. Um, again, if we have energy being produced, this is again going to be an exothermic reaction, and it will have a negative sign. And if we have energy going into, along with the reactants, then we're going to refer to this as an endo process, or endothermic process, okay? Now, the way that we study this is through what's called calorimetry. This is the science of measuring heat, and a calorimeter is simply a device used to experimentally find the heat associated with a chemical reaction, um, and there's a couple of different types that we will look at. Uh, substances will respond differently when heated. Some will combust, and some will react, some will not. Um, and so again, the calorimetry and the thermo piece is that third part of the formal chemistry definition of studying the heat and energy transfers that go along with reactions. Now heat capacity is usually abbreviated with this capital C, although occasionally you will see it written also as a capital S. It kind of depends on the source, unfortunately. Um, and sometimes we don't always use the same letter. So just as a reminder, but the heat capacity or the sp is how much heat it takes to raise a substance's temperature by one degree Celsius or Kelvin. Um, the amount of energy depends on the amount of the sub substance. So therefore, it's going to be an extensive property, OK, an extensive property. And the reason that we can interchange Celsius or Kelvin here is that the increments on these scales are exactly the same. So when we write the um, units for these, okay, it's going to be the heat capacity or the specific heat is going to be the heat absorbed in joules over the temperature in um, Celsius or Kelvin. So we can substitute those without having to do any, any big math there. Okay, now specific heat capacity, okay, is going to be S and specific heat capacity per gram. Okay, so again, you have to kind of pay attention to how things are defined and what abbreviations that we're using and what term that we are referring to. And so if we're talking about the 
specific heat capacity of something, it's how much energy does it take per gram to raise something one degree Celsius or one degree Kelvin. And if you just quickly look at this comparison list, at the top of the list you have liquid water. Liquid, has a, liquid water has a very high specific heat, meaning that it takes a lot of energy to raise the temperature of water, which is a good thing um, for us because it means that we can absorb a lot of heat and temperature differences without having issues, I guess. On the flip side, you have some substances like aluminum and iron. Their specific heat capacity is much lower than water. So they're not going to be able, it's going to take much less energy to raise those materials um, by different temperature scales. Okay, now the molar heat capacity. Again, we've got specific heat capacity per gram. We have molar heat capacity per mole. And the only difference here is we're substituting in grams for moles and we can do that again to be able to compare substances. Now if we have constant pressure calorimetry, and we'll see some of these in lab, this uses a very simpler calorimeter, which is essentially a coffee cup or a styrofoam cup um, measuring a temperature difference because it's open to air. And since it's open to the air, we refer to that as the constant pressure. Um, and it's used to find changes in enthalpy, or what are referred to as heats of reaction, particularly for reactions occurring in solution. So again, a little bit back to the solution stoichiometry, because if it's a constant pressure situation, the heat is directly related or is equal to that change in enthalpy for that system. Now heat of reaction, again, is extensive, meaning it's going to depend on how much is there. So that's why we usually write them per mole, so that we can compare them from substance to substance that's side by side. Now for constant pressure calorimetry, essentially here's your styrofoam cup, you've got a stir bar, and you've got a thermometer. So if there's a reaction going on in here, we can measure the temperature. And again, we'll see some of these in lab, but when two reactions are mixed and the temperature increases, the chemical reaction must be releasing, so it is going to be an exothermic reaction. Obviously the opposite would be the case for endothermic, but if it's exothermic, the released energy from the reaction increases the motion of molecules, which is going to also result in having a higher temperature because kinetic energy and temperature and motion are all directly related. Okay, constant pressure calorimetry, again, if we assume that the calorimeter did not leak energy or absorb any of itself, and that is a huge error source of error when you're talking about calorimetry calculations, um, and that all the energy was used to increase the temperature, then we can find the energy released by the reaction. And this is usually our um, equation. And we've, we saw this in Chem 1, where you have the energy is um, equal to the specific heat, specific heat capacity times the mass times the delta T. Okay, so that's going to be where those reactions come from. And this P down here is referring to the fact that it is constant um, pressure. That's what that is referring to, is that it's a constant pressure scenario. Okay, now constant volume uses what's called a bomb calorimeter. We are not going to use one of these, um, so I don't have one in class. But essentially you take reactants that have already been pre-massed or pre-weighed, you place them inside this rigid steel container, and you ignite them hence the name bomb calorimeter. Um, there's water surrounding the reactant container, so the temperature of it and the other parts are measured before and after the reaction. And it looks kind of like this. So for this one, we can manipulate the equations a little bit so that we eventually end up with the energy released by the reaction is equal to the temperature change, which again is going to be final minus initial, times what's called this um, property, which is the heat capacity of the calorimeter. Okay, so that would be a case where someone had examined the calorimeter and come up with what's called the heat capacity for this calorimeter, which is going to be specific to certain things. Okay, so we've got constant pressure calorimetry, we've got heat capacity um, calorimetry, which is going to involve constant volume, and now we're going to do some math problems that relate to those things. Okay.